Excellent. Next question, please. Uh, hi there. Um, I was raised by a mother who was a feminist and uh, is a questioning Christian at the moment. And she finds that there's some contradictions uh, somewhere in the Bible that states that male have to be dominant over women and women have to be submissive. So just from a Christian perspective, does God favor a gender specifically? And you know why? Uh, what I think, uh, your mother has a fair question there. I don't think it's just in a vacuum or in any sense of just trying to be cavalier about it. Uh, not just that. You think of uh, the very nation that he chose through whom to reveal, him and reveal himself. He could have chosen Rome. He could have chosen Greece. He could have chosen Babylon. In fact, William T. Ewers talking about it in a piece of poetry said, how odd of God to choose the Jews. But then he went on to say, how odd are still are those who reject whom God chose. God, I think, oftentimes in life, for the human life, chooses the weakest through whom to make his strength manifest. If you were to ask me what really makes this world, you know, let me dispel one idea here. You often hear a statement, men are more cerebral, women are more emotional. Nothing is farther from the truth. But I'll tell you what I have found. Both are equal cerebrally, but women are more consistent in willing to let the thought be connected to the emotion. Men like to hide from the emotional ramifications of the thought. So if I talk to my mother, she'd immediately connect the emotion with what she was thinking with my father, he could draw circles around it because he'd run from the feeling. I've talked to husband and wife. We were on a, on a vacation once, and they had both lost a son. And the woman was talking to my wife and said, it has put such a strain on our marriage because my husband doesn't even want to talk about it while I'm breaking up on the inside. They both had the same thoughts. One was running from it, the other was willing to find the greatest bridge between in life between the head and the heart. So, there, so even in theory, the whole idea is wrong. Secondly, some of the finest thinking in the world has been done by womankind. You see it. So this myth has to be dispensed with. It's purely an archaic thing. But to your question, is the Bible dishonorable like this in gender? We've just had Joe Vitale who is uh, on our team from, from Oxford. She has just defended her doctoral dissertation at Oxford on this very issue and this very subject, de demonstrating how strongly the Bible speaks of the equality of the genders and what it is God has in mind and the complementariness of the two. So here is my question to you. If God were a discriminator against gender, the greatest truth on which the gospel hangs is the resurrection. If Christ be not raised from the dead, our faith is in vain. Why in heaven's name did he reveal himself to the women to go and tell the message? All of Easter, all of Easter hangs on the testimony of womankind with whom he trusted the entire gospel. When the woman with the alabaster ointment came to him and those were frowning about her, he looked at them and said, be quiet. Wherever the gospel is preached, there shall also this be told, what this woman has done to me in worship. He paid her the greatest compliment that the gospel would be carried to the ends of the earth, and this story of this woman's faith will also be told. He goes to Samaria, and he sees a woman of the well with five broken, shattered marriages. She was ethnical, ethnically barred from the society, as it were, maritally broken and shattered five times. He made her the first evangelist to the Samaritan world. Imagine what an incredibly gracious God to remind us that none of us is superior to the other. We only have the same privilege of taking our distinctives and complementary strengths 
and carrying the message to the world. I can tell you this, I would never be here today if it weren't for the strength of my mother. And when, when my younger brother was six or seven years old, he was dying with double pneumonia and typhoid. My dad had given up. Our family had given up. We were living in Delhi. And the doctor came and told us, my younger brother Ramesh, who's today the chairman of the Department of Pain Management at McMaster University in, uh, uh, in Canada. He was six or seven, dying. I remember seeing him as a bag of bones for the last time. I'm uh, uh, four, six years older than him. And I walked away from there bidding him goodbye. He was unconscious. My mother refused to leave. She refused to leave. She sat by his bedside, and we were all worn to the bone, including my dad. And so four of us kids, packed up, taken back home, and all of us lying in bed saying, we've just lost our youngest. My mother sat by his bedside. Whatever she was doing, I don't know, and in sheer exhaustion, for days she hadn't slept, and just by his bedside, crying out to God to rescue her son. Somewhere in the early hours of the morning, he began to move and began to, he was very much alive, but just quite worn out and broken. And that need of life was coming back to him. And the next day, when we all were told to come back to the hospital, his eyes were open and his whole life given fresh strength. There was only one out of the six of us there who had the strength to sit by that bedside and watch what loomed as a tragedy and watch the triumph to turn into victory. Anybody who thinks that's weak and lesser doesn't understand reality. God is the God of humankind. And the last thing Jesus said on the cross for the redemption of mankind was look at a young man and tell him not to forget his mother to make sure she was also taken care of because a sword was piercing through her heart. That is our Lord who treats all of us with intrinsic worth and reflective splendor. And I thank God for the beauty he has created in this complementariness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.